name is Troy. Um, I'm a sophomore here at Creighton. I'm from York, Nebraska, about an hour and a half west of here. And this is the first time in my life I've ever been scared to speak in front of people. Okay, here we go. Let's take a minute and imagine waking up knowing you have one task today. Attend your best friend's funeral. I woke up, got ready like a normal morning with the same routine. As I slipped back into my high school football jersey to show the brotherhood in the team and laced up my wrestling shoes to display no man walks alone. I prepared for the hardest thing I've ever confronted. We attended the funeral, and I watched as basically my second mother cry for an hour straight throughout the service. I could see the aging already setting in from the minutes, hours, and days of consistent crying, stress, and depression. As I approached the closed casket to receive communion, I reenacted her old handshake for one last goodbye. The service ended and we showed our condolences. I gave his mom the biggest hug I could, swinging her around in the air. I know that for one moment that day, she smiled. The smile cracked, it was probably the first time, like I said. I drove a car, full of a band full of brothers, uh, joined by football, but held together by the blood, sweat, and tears that we all shared. I remember every aspect of that day, down to the footprint in the snow, as I walked to stand next to my buddy. Not a detail has been forgotten about that day. Although I probably hadn't counted mental health at some point in my life, um, probably through high school, I really never noticed it, and I didn't understand it. Uh, the first time I was affected by mental health was first semester of my freshman year. I was up studying one night, talking to a buddy, and he texted me, and um, he goes, hey, can we talk? I said, of course. Um, I'd only known him for about two months. He asked me if we could meet up, and we did. We sat down on the bench, started talking about our normal day-to-day -day routine. Nothing really was different. And then he said, okay, now I gotta tell you why we're here. It was the one year anniversary of when he tried to take his own life. He was obviously struggling with this, like anyone would be. And I was without a doubt willing to listen, comfort, and cry with him. Because that's not easy for any of us to deal with, especially alone. Now as much as I was there for him and just trying to give him the best condolences I could, I was stunned that he, of all people, had this weight on his shoulder. My friend is a very upbeat, happy, fun-loving, put a smile on your face kind of guy. You probably talk to him, and I guarantee you enjoy his presence. He's also one of the most intelligent kids I know. Everything seemed to be completely normal for this kid, if not amazing. It blew my mind he ever felt depressed, especially to this level. So we talked for a few hours and left with smiles on our face. In the months following, every now and again, he would tell me he had been cutting himself in the last week, but he was doing better. I would try to be positive and helpful as I could, but the question came to me, why is he coming to me? The next chapter in my story is also about one of my good friends from back home. It was Christmas break and my parents had told me that his mom mentioned he had had a rough semester. So my brothers, my friend, and his brother, all of us were going out to Colorado to de-stress for a few days. Before we left on the trip, I saw him a few times and we hung out and I asked him every time if everything was okay, how he was doing. He always responded, yeah, dude, I'm good, don't worry about it. But I knew something was wrong. Finally, one night, we were hanging out in my basement and he said he had something important to tell me. I was thankful he was finally ready to talk about it. He told me his story, and I couldn't believe it. Another great friend who tried to take his own life. He informed me he was very depressed, anxious, stressed, disappointed in himself. College had changed him. In high school, he was a good kid, didn't get into trouble, didn't party or any of that. When he got to college, he started drinking every day, smoking weed, and every now and again abusing cocaine. If his friend wasn't in the room the night he attempted suicide, I would have been attending another funeral my freshman year. So we went to Colorado, cleared his head, slowly everything got back to normal, and he's healthy again. I'm glad we were able to fix it with just some good times. When I didn't know what to do, I realized that all I had to do was to be there and support my friends. Sometimes offering advice and sometimes just support, but being there. I love when people come to talk to me more than anything. I always have 15 minutes for a friend or someone who needs help. I love to talk as well. I'll take a four minute story and make it 12. But sometimes, sometimes our lives get out of control and there's only so much one can do without a little help from a friend. So come to me if you need help. And that's why it's the next chapter of my story is so hard. Um, if you're not attended, this is where it starts. The day was January 27, 2015. It was about 9.20 in the morning and I was walking down the mall from class to class. I got a call from one of my good friends from back home and with a choked up voice he said, J.J. killed himself this morning. I truly thought he was joking just because that's kind of 
you're just that close, you don't believe it. Um, JJ was a great guy, one of my best friends, and he was going to college to play sports, and everything seemed perfect in his life. I didn't believe it, but that didn't mean it wasn't true. We cried on the phone, not saying a word to each other. We cried together in silence. To deal with it, I did the only thing I knew to do, push it aside and deal with it later. Rather quickly, I realized I couldn't push this kind of thing aside. As I laid in bed, I called my mom because I didn't know where else to turn. I finally got the story of what had happened in his life. I went into intimate details about how he didn't leave a note for anybody. How the week before, his girlfriend, Kayla, had found out that he cheated on her and she obviously ended their relationship. But on top of the guilt he felt from that, there were dozens of posts on the social media site called Yikyak saying things like, thank God JJ screwed up so we can have a chance with this girl. JJ Vanderheim is so shitty. JJ Vanderheim is the biggest douchebag in the town of New York. And a lot of things of that nature. I called home to talk to my dad. He made it clear just how strong I had to be, not only for myself, but for all of my friends. After the funeral, I was doing okay for about a week. Um, then not taking care of myself really took its toll. Life started getting pretty stressful between school, my different friend groups, having a girlfriend, and joining a fraternity. I saw that I couldn't take care of anything or anyone if I didn't take care of myself. You see, although I wanted to be as strong for my friends, my world had crumbled just as much, and I didn't give myself a chance to grieve or understand the situation. I was lucky though. Um, two days after his passing, I was uh, I joined a fraternity. Um, at this point, I was at my lowest of lows, and they were there for me. We had a retreat a couple weeks after the funeral, and I spoke to them about the hardest time of my life. I told my brothers the same story I'm telling you now. I was with 30, 30 men who I didn't even know, and we sat there, and as I looked up from crying, I saw 30 men crying with me. To think I believe I could handle that by myself is just silly. They were there for me. I found out that night who on my fraternity class had struggled with mental illness. I was not alone. One of my best friends now told me that my story convinced him to not take his own life because he saw how it affected him and he did, couldn't do that to a brother. Once again, I felt blessed that some good came out of what I had experienced. So now I went on my conscience, those three friends who had tried to take their lives and I had no clue or ever suspected a thing for any of them. Along with 10 friends um, from back home who were good friends with JJ had confronted me last year at their graduation and told me of their struggles with it, and I didn't even know most of my name. This is, when it hit, this is probably when I hit my all time low last uh, spring. Right then I accepted that I needed help. On what level I really wasn't sure, but these emotions I was feeling and changing my personality basically spelled out that what I was doing was not okay. All this time, I had been pushing off talking to my parents because I was scared, nervous, and a little bit embarrassed. Um, the stigma that affected all of my friends had finally begun to affect me. There's a way that many adults, students, teenagers of all sexes and races see mental health. They see it with the stigma, but that is why we're here today. We're here to change the conversation, be the accepting students, who will become the accepting parents and grandparents. My mom suggested I go to a counselor, but I. So by simply talking to her, um, I came to the conclusion I didn't need to. I found help just through reaching out to my parents and my friends. I'm doing better now and I strive to be as helpful to people um, struggling with this as possible. I'm still trying to take care of myself realistically. I still need to talk to people, but uh, when I figure it out, if I need to, I will go to a counselor because the counseling service here at Creed is great. One in three college kids suffer from men mental illness. That one person can be you, or it can be your friend. But it doesn't have to be stigmatized. You are not alone. Active Minds and the Creighton University faculty and staff are always by your side. We are never alone.